Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to day three of chapter eight. Today, we are moving on to 8.2. We are looking at constructing a confidence interval for the population proportion and conditions for estimating the population proportion. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to state um, and check the random 10% and large counts conditions for constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion. You will also be able to determine critical values for calculating a C% percent confidence interval for a population proportion using a table or technology. All right, let's start it. So 8.2, day one, confidence intervals for a proportion. You can read much of the following information on pages 552 to 558. All right, so we're often interested in estimating the proportion P of some outcome in a population. So here's some examples of questions that we might look into. What proportion of U.S. adults are unemployed right now? What proportion of high school students have cheated on a test? What proportion of pine trees in a national park are infested with beetles? What proportion of a company's laptop batteries last as long as the company claims? So in this section, you will learn how to construct and interpret a confidence interval for a population proportion that would be able to answer some of these questions. Notice it's asking what proportion. That indicates that we want to figure out an estimate, which is why we would be using a confidence interval for our method. So constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion. Let's start with what is the name of the procedure we use when calculating a confidence interval for a proportion? The formal name is a one sample Z interval for a population proportion, or a one sample Z interval for P. One sample because we are taking a single sample from a single population. Z, because that is going to be our critical value, referencing z-scores from normal curves. And an interval, I mean, we're coming up with a, an interval of plausible values. And then identifying what we're finding that interval for. All right, so one sample is the interval for P. And we can do this when conditions are met. So when conditions are met, a C% percent confidence interval for the unknown um, proportion, P, is as follows. We would take our point estimate, our sample proportion, plus minus our critical value, which is Z star, times the square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat, all divided by N. So this formula is where z star is the critical value for the standard normal curve with c percent of its area between negative z star and positive z star. So the central area will match the confidence percent. And then we're trying to figure out how many um, standard deviations from the center of our distribution we would need to be to encompass that percent in the middle. Now, let's start with the conditions. So what are the conditions for estimating P? And I highly recommend that you read page 554 for additional explanation, right? There's much more in-depth information on page 554. I couldn't fit it all here. Now, without making this video 20 years. All right, so to make sure the formula for a one sample Z interval for a population proportion is valid, we need to verify that the observations in the sample can be viewed as independent and that the sampling distribution of p hat is approximately normal. So these are the two main things that we're looking for. Now we do this by checking three conditions. And let's discuss them one at a time. So first of all, we have the random condition. The data come from a random sample from the population of interest. We actually need to be able to state this. Now don't just tell me it comes from a random sample. Tell me what random sample was taken. Now, why do we need to check this? This is so that we can identify um, that individual observations are independent and we can generalize about the population. Now, a subset of the random condition is the 10% condition. All right, we check this, um, we check that's reasonable to assume that the population size is more than 10 times the sample size, or we say it's reasonable to assume that our sample size is less than 10% of the population size. You can state it either way. If you actually know the population size, you can check this um, inequality. If you don't know the population size, then you can just state it's reasonable to assume that the sample size is less than 10% of the population size. Now, why do we do this? Right? This is so that we can view observations as independent, even though we're sampling without replacement. Now, 
this condition came from our sampling distribution condition. All right, in order to calculate our standard deviation formula for our sampling distributions, we had to ensure independence. Random sampling ensures that the individual observations are independent of each other, but if we sample more than 10% of our population, then our standard deviation formula is not going to accurately estimate what the standard deviation really is from our sampling distribution of p hat. So we have to do also double check the 10% condition as well. Now this is only checked when we are sampling without replacement. If you're flipping a coin, coin flips can happen infinitely long and the process itself is independent. This is only sampling without replacement from a finite population. Now, the last condition that we need to check is that we can actually use an, a normal curve to approximate the sampling distribution of p hat. For this, we use the large counts condition. Again, in chapter seven, we learned that we needed to have our sample size times our population proportion greater than or equal to 10 and our sample size times um, one minus our proportion greater than or equal to 10. Now, we don't know our population proportion when we're calculating an interval. So we replace the population proportion with the sample proportion. Essentially, we're looking to see, do we have at least 10 successes and 10 failures from our sample data? And why do we look at this? This is so that the sampling distribution of p hat will be approximately normal, and we can actually use z star to do our calculations. Now, the general formula for a confidence interval in AP statistics is as follows. The confidence interval is equal to the point estimate plus minus the margin of error. And the two factors that determine the margin of error are the critical value and the standard error of the statistic, which are z star for the critical value and the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by n is the standard error of the statistic. Okay, let's move on to our next page. And let's talk more about the standard error of p hat and what it measures. So what is the standard error of p hat? What does it measure? The definition, when the standard deviation of a statistic is estimated from data, the result is called the standard error of the statistic. So when we have to use our sample data to help us estimate the standard deviation, we change the name from standard deviation of statistic to standard error of statistic. Now, as you learned in chapter seven, when the 10% condition is met, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat is approximately the square root of the population proportion times one minus the population proportion divided by n. Now, all of this is within that square root. Now, in practice, we don't actually know the value of the population proportion. If we did, we wouldn't need to construct a confidence interval for it. So in large random samples, p hat will be close to p. So we replace p in the formula with the, uh, for the standard deviation of the sample proportion with p hat to get the standard error which we often abbreviate as SE, of the sample proportion p hat. All right, so standard error of the sample proportion is equal to the square root of the sample proportion times one minus sample proportion divided by n. The only thing that changed was subbing p hat in place of p. Because in our large random samples, p hat is gonna be close to p anyway, so we can go ahead and use it for our estimate. The standard error of p hat is an estimate of the standard deviation of p hat using data from the sample. Therefore, the standard error estimates how far the value of p hat typically varies from the population proportion. Now, how do we calculate a critical value for a confidence interval for a proportion? We know how to calculate our standard error of statistic. Now let's look at how we calculate z star. All right, so. For our example here, find the critical value z star for a 95% confidence interval. So the central area is 0 0.95. 95%, so 95 divided by 100 gives you 0.95. Notice that over here we have the central area identified as 0 0.95. Alright, so just as a reminder, the critical value is a multiplier that makes the margin of error large enough to give a specific amount of confidence that the interval um, contains the value of the parameter. First thing you want to do, label the central area of the standard normal curve with the confidence level for C. So that 95%, 0.95, central area, 0.95. I jumped ahead a little bit. 
Next, calculate the area in each tail. Well, the tails are perfect, because this curve is perfectly symmetric and we're looking at the 0.95 as being the central area, a standard normal curve is still just a density curve. And the area under any density curve is equal to one. So if I take one minus my central area, I have the remaining area that is equally split between these two tails. And so the remaining area total is 0 0.05. I need to split it in two to have the two different tails have the same area. So 0 0.05 divided by two gave me 0 0.025. That's how I know that my two tail areas are 0 0.025. If this were 90, I would have taken one minus 0.90 gotten 0.10, and then gotten 0 0.05 on each side. If this were 0.99, I would do the same sort of thing. So this kind of process works every time so you can find your tails. Now to find negative z star down here, you would use the left tail area of 0 0.025. To find positive z star, use the left tail plus the central area. So 0 0.025 plus 0.95 would give you 0.975. I leave it up to you guys whether you find negative z star or positive z star. It's going to be the same regardless except for the sign. Now, it's often easier to find negative z and then turn z star positive by using the left tail area. So that 0 0.025, if you go to your student resources packet and into your standard normal curve table and you follow down along the z column, until you get down to negative 1.9 and you follow that across to 0 0.06, you'll see this 0 0.0250. So you look for the area that matches the tail. Follow that out to the sides and up. Off to the left side is the beginning part of your z-score. And then the hundredths get combined onto that to get the hundredths place for this. That's how we read that z is equal to negative 0.196 um, is the z-score with an area of 0 0.025 to its left. All right, so that number cuts off an area of 0 0.025. You could also use technology in the command inverse norm. So go to second vars to get to distribution. And option three is inverse norm. You'll type in your area, so 0 0.025. Your mean is zero, standard deviation one, because we're looking at the standard normal curve, the normal curve made up of z-scores. And that gives us a z-score of negative 1.96 also. And that means that our z-star is positive 1.96. Consider this to be the distance from, um, from the center and distance from zero is positive. Right. Because we're both adding and subtracting it in our formula, there it is. Because we're both adding and subtracting z star, we just turn z star positive after we found the z score. Right. Now, if you want to get a positive z score so you don't have to remember to turn it positive, you could just use the total left-hand area up to positive z star, which in this case is that 0 0.025 plus that 0 0.95, which gives you this. So that's where I'm using the 0 0.975 as my area, mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and using inverse norm, that gives us a z-score of positive 1.96, so z star is 1.96. Take a look at our last page here for this lesson. And what is the specific formula for calculating a confidence interval for a population proportion? Is it on the formula sheet? And how do the three parts of the formula relate um, to the three conditions? So we've already taken a look at this on the first page. P hat plus minus Z star times the square root of P hat times one minus P hat over N. Now, is it on the formula sheet? Kind of. The general formula is there. We have, um, for the confidence interval, it's the statistic plus minus critical value times standard error of the statistic. So the general formula is there. Also, the formula for the standard error of the statistic is on the very next page. So you can actually put this together by filling in the pieces.
Now, the way that it relates to the three conditions, random helps to ensure that p hat is an unbiased estimate. The 10% condition allows us to use the standard error formula even when sampling without replacement. And the large counts condition allows us to use a normal curve to get the critical value. So each one of our conditions allows us to verify that all three pieces that make up the um, confidence interval are valid to calculate and use in the way that we're doing them. All right, so for our example for this lesson, what proportion of US adults contribute to crowdfunding campaigns such as GoFundMe? So in a random sample of 1,535, U.S. adults, 487 reported that they give to a crowdfunding campaign in a typical year. So letter A, we need to verify that the conditions for calculating a confidence interval, P, have been met. First, the random condition. So if we take a look back at this problem, it told us that a random sample of 1,535 U.S. adults was taken. And that's exactly what you write. Random, a random sample of 1,535 1, US adults was taken. So that one can be checked off. Now the 10% condition. We need to state that it is reasonable to assume that 1,535 is less than 10% of all US adults. Now there are a lot of adults in the United States. If this is, an, if this is a reasonable assumption to make, then you can state that's a reasonable assumption. If you know that you're dealing with all adults from the population of a large country, or you are dealing with um, all of the students in a large school district, something along those lines, or from a large city, generally it's reasonable to assume that you have sampled less than 10% of the population. Just make sure that you put the, co the population in context. And then finally, the large counts condition the number of successes, 487, and the number of failures, you can just go ahead and subtract to calculate that, um, 1,048 are both at least 10. So this part right here, where we were taking n times p hat greater than or equal to 10 and n times 1 minus p hat greater than or equal to 10, this is how you would calculate this if you were given the sample proportion instead of the raw values. In our problem, we were actually given the successes and the failures. Now, the way that I know this is that 489 reported that they give to crowdfunding, um, a crowdfunding campaign in a typical year. That is your number of successes. That went right down in here for your number of successes. And then if you take your sample size minus your number of successes, that's how you get your number of failures. So that's how I was calculating those. Now for letter B, calculate a 90% confidence interval for P. All right, so I need 90%. And that's why I have 0.90 in the middle of my normal curve here. So let's see what all we need to calculate. To calculate our confidence interval, I need p hat. So I took p hat equals my number of successes divided by the total number of people asked, which is approximately point, uh, 0 0.317. I did round here. So that is going to substitute in place of, so p hat, this number substitutes in place of p hat in my formula here, here, and here. All right, so you can see that those are the place, the three places where p hat shows up in your formula. My original sample size goes in place of n down here at the bottom. And the only other thing that I need to find is my z star. That's what I'm doing down in here. 
So my sample purport, or my um, sampling distribute, the standard normal curve, apologies for that. So my standard normal curve has the 0.90 as a central area. I have 10% um, for the total outside area, which would be basically 5% or 0 0.05 for my outer tails. So if I use that left-hand tail of 0 0.05, Z is going to equal inverse norm, area of 0 0.05, mean of zero standard deviation of one, because I'm dealing with the standard normal curve for Z-scores. And that equals negative 1.645 approximately. So that means that Z star is going to be positive 1.645. And that's my remaining value that I'm putting into my formula. The answer I got from right here replaces Z star right there. And then it's just a matter of entering the values into the calculator. I typed all of this on the other side of the plus minus sign into the calculator to get approximately 0 0.1 or 0 0.0195. And then I took the 0 0.317, which is my p hat, minus 0 0.0195 to get 0 0.2975. And I also added it onto the 0 0.317 to get 0 0.3365. And when you're writing your interval, you write it um, basically using inter interval notation, your lower bound, comma, your upper bound. Within parentheses, the parentheses represent that we don't necessarily include our outer boundaries because we can't get exact values for those. Right. And then finally, Interpret the interval from part B. We are 90% confident that the interval from 0 0.2975 to 0 0.3365 captures the true proportion of U.S. adults who would typically give to a crowdfunding campaign in a typical year. I use the context from right here. Along with the idea of the U.S. adults, to have the context down here. And I use the word true proportion to identify that this is the population. Okay. Try these problems and I'll see you in class.